By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and we, we cried. When we remembered Zion, which is another term for Jerusalem, we hanged our harps on the willow trees in the midst of the place where we were. And there in Babylon, those who carried us away captive demanded that we sing a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth. Everyone say mirth. Uh, we don't use the term mirth too much, but we had some mirth going on this morning here during the praise of worship. How many of you know what mirth is? Yeah. Mirth is, what would be another word for mirth? Joy. Joy, overflowing joy, celebratory joy. Uh, it's, it's another way of saying celebration and the, the heart and the attitude that goes along with it. That's mirth. So those that wasted us and were our captors demanded of us that we sing and they demanded mirth saying sing us one of your songs of Zion but how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land what a verse amazing well <clears throat> that comes from Psalms hundreds of years before uh, Christ came when the Jews were in Babylonian captivity. And the Jews in Babylonian captivity realized that they couldn't just sing about the Lord's presence and experience mirth without being in the Lord's presence. That's what that was all about. How can we experience joy and praise and worship have a praise and worship time when we are about 750 miles outside of Zion or outside of Jerusalem. In other words, we're not anywhere near the presence of God. So we can't, we can't show our mirth just because we're singing and making noise on our guitars and so forth. So you get the idea that true praise isn't so much an activity as it is a place. You don't do praise, you enter praise. It would help to begin to think of praise not as an it that you can do, but as a him, who he is, him, H-I-M, who you embrace and enter in and have relation, uh, relationship with. Mirth as the Bible uses the term, is referring to that just, and, and we were experiencing it, feeling it this morning, that warm joy of the Lord, that it's beyond just human gladness. It is the warmth of the Lord's presence. It, it fills us with joy that gives us strength. You forget your troubles. Um, you know, the Bible says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking among yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. In other words, as you praise God, something magical, something special happens. We know that it's truly spiritual. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's more than emotion. It's a state of mirth, which is the joy and the warmth and the presence of God, glory to God, that comes in as we begin to praise the Lord. In fact, mirth is the goal or the destination of praise. That's why we praise. That's what we should be trying to get into. When we begin to praise the Lord, you should have in mind, and I should have in mind, a goal, a destination, mirth. I want to experience the mirth, and I am going to be filled and overflowing with mirth. You see, music does not produce mirth. Uh, entering into praise brings mirth because truly, truly praise is a destination. It's something you enter. It's not an it that you do. Let's talk for a minute about the presence of God because this morning's message is all about praise and the presence, the presence of God. You know, the first thing that God gave Adam was his presence that was God's first gift to Adam, was to live 
in the presence of God. And in that presence, he had fellowship, they had communion, they had a friendship. It was a very dynamic and real and tangible relationship. And that was the first thing that Adam received from God, was God's personal presence. But the presence of God was also the first thing that Adam forfeited, that he lost when he fell in sin. Adam's sin, the consequence of it, uh, was banishment from the presence of God. It cost mankind God's presence here in the physical world. In the early days before Adam's sin, and he fellowship with God in the garden, the world wasn't like it is today, as you can imagine. God's presence, more than just the beauty of the whatever the nature was, his very presence created the environment that Adam lived in. Adam gave us the world that we live in or the condition of the world that we live in today. When he forfeited God's presence, he was literally banished from the presence of God. So the world that we live in today is a world without God's presence. In a few minutes, I'm going to make a couple comments about the difference between God's omnipresence, which is a theological principle, and God's tangible presence, which is an actual encounter with God. And what's the difference between them? Because we can get confused about it, and if you're going to talk about praise, you must understand the difference between the concept of God's omnipresence and the actuality of his manifest presence. But let me just simply say this, that God's presence, the manifest presence of God, where does it fit in in a hostile, sin-drenched world that maintains a constant atmosphere of denial and unbelief towards God? Where does God's manifest presence come in in a world like the one that we live in today. The air is charged with unbelief. The atmosphere, the environment, the spiritual, the social, the familial, the political, the entire atmosphere of the world is under the domain of the kingdom of darkness. That's exactly what Jesus said when he called him the prince of this world. We expect God to operate in this environment. We expect that the will of God should be just happening. But Jesus made it very clear that God's will cannot happen in this world, in this environment, until there are agents of his, humans that he created to rule over, to whom he gave the authority over this environment, though they turned it over to the devil, though they lost that authority and became slaves. Once he set them free, they became sons and daughters of the living God. We are spiritual insurgents in the kingdom of darkness. We are bearers of the armors of light. We are the sons and daughters of the Most High God. So where is there a place for God to fit into this environment? I want you to think about the incredible conflict that you and I get up and face every day in this world and then we get frustrated because it doesn't seem like God is moving the obstacles out of the way or why are all these dark and terrible things happening? And there is a very simple biblical answer that I've alluded to this morning as to why. The world is a praiseless atmosphere. It's a heartless and faithless atmosphere and it's hostile to God. So you need to understand that is the world you and I were born into and as it presently stands today. Um, do you remember Jesus when he was in Nazareth? The Bible says he could not do many mighty works there. Jesus went to Capernaum. He went to all the other towns, cities, Cana, and he would, he would show. He'd let his light show a little bit, turning the water into wine or opening the eyes of the blind. Or the testimonies of the miracles he had performed would precede him as he'd enter a village or a town. They had heard the testimonies. People praised him. People acknowledged him. There was an acknowledgement. There was a praise 
of, of, uh, of the works and that they ascribed that praise to God. And because of it, he would do more works. He would continue. But when he entered Nazareth, something peculiar happened. And the Bible says that their familiarity basically bred contempt. They said, well, we know him. And they lodged themselves into a state of unbelief. They, they bound themselves in a harsh position against Jesus. And the Bible says, Jesus didn't get angry and say, well, I'm not putting my hands on anybody. I'm not going to heal anybody. It doesn't say he wouldn't heal. The Bible says he could not heal. He could not do many great works in Nazareth because their atmosphere remained shut off from him. What I want to deal with this morning for the next few minutes is the fact that genuine true praise opens the atmosphere for the presence of God. If it was the sin of man that forfeited God's presence, the privilege of being a child of God that can truly praise God. You have the privilege of praising God. You don't have to have a great voice. We, we've kind of proven that here this morning, haven't we? Praise the Lord. Um, you don't have to be able to play a musical instrument. Uh, you don't have to know any fancy songs. It's really your heart song that lifts up praise to God. The privilege of true praise is the return of God's presence. It is true praise that returns the presence of God into the world. And uh, that's why Jesus said in John chapter 4, when he talked about true praise and worship, he said, the Father is seeking those who will worship him, and I just like to take the phrase spirit and truth, which we'll be sharing in weeks to come a little bit about it, and just distill it down and say that's true praise. True praise. So the, the Bible says God is looking for people who can enter into true praise. So would you buy that along with me, that Jesus was basically saying that? God is looking for people who can enter in, not just who can do, but who can enter in to true praise. God is actually out there looking for you. He's looking. Many of us are looking in our circumstances. Where is God in all this? All you have to do is to begin to become a true praiser of God. Boom. He's found you. He's looking for you. Hallelujah. So the, the, the term, the presence of God, you need to understand that the term, the presence of God, is a term that's relative only in the physical world. When God made the universe and he made creation, he made the earth and he made us in his image and he put us in the world, he created the world to be physical. God's perfect will is that we have physical bodies. His perfect will uh, is that the world is physical. And even though we see the diseases and the sicknesses and the infections from within human life to throughout all of the creation of the world, that is the result of sin. But in the beginning, God created the world to be physical. So God, who is spirit, intersects the physical world, and that we call his presence. And it was a man that he had made that loved him and welcomed him and lived for his praise and glory that brought God into the garden every day to have communion. The minute that man rebelled and stepped out, he left and was banished from the presence. And the earth lost the presence of God and picked up the presence of Satan, the presence of the prince of darkness. Now, God's omnipresence and God's manifest presence are not the same. It's like having a picture of your home in your iPhone versus being at home. I can whip out if I'm traveling, if I'm overseas somewhere, I'm away from home, I get lonely, I was over at home with my wife or whatever. I could pick, pull out a picture. And I'm just kind of reminding myself, well, I do have a home. And there it is, and brings forth, you know, some feet warm feelings. But it's not the same as being at home, is it? There's being there, and then there's knowing about it, looking at a picture. So the omnipresence of God, the omnipresence is the truth about God's potential for you to think on 
when you think about him. But the manifest presence of God is engagement with God when you bring him in to the physical environment of your life through praising him. You see the difference? Manifest presence is contact and is engagement. Omnipresence is theoretical. It's based on a truth, but you only can engage the omnipresence of God mentally in your imagination. So, you with me so far? We get the difference? We're talking about the manifest presence of God. Oftentimes in church, we have praise and worship, but people never rise beyond omnipresence thinking and realize that there is an actual presence that God wants to bring. And so when they sing, they sing from a historic perspective. Oh, the Lord's worthy. The Lord died on the cross. The Lord raised from the dead. We, these things are wonderful. They're beautiful thoughts. They're awesome. But there's never really any manifest presence of God that takes place. Because in their praise, they never rise beyond just thinking or expecting. See, without faith, there's no door for the Lord to enter in. Without an expectation, which is another way of describing faith, without an expectation of a visit with God, you're just dealing with the thoughts of God. And so, unfortunately, religion has gotten a hold of the church of Jesus Christ, and it happened pretty quick, back in the first century, and really shut down the presence of God. After a while, the miracles and signs and wonders began to stop happening. What were those, anyway? The theologians always get it wrong. They never get it right. They always say that it was some sort of special magic that God did just to show the world that he was God. But the reality is that they've never really understood it's the extension of his character. It's what happens when his physical presence comes into the physical world. When his holy presence comes into the physical world, death and all of its effects begin to crumble before his presence. Darkness cannot maintain a hold when the light comes in. Have you ever gone into a dark room in your house? I got up this morning at 3 in the morning. Fortunately, I know my way around my house. Um, you know, and I started going from room to room doing a few things. And um, the reality is, whenever I turn on a light, I never see darkness struggling to stay in the room. There's never a conflict. I never see the light going, you have to leave. And the doctor's saying, I'm not leaving. And the light says, you've got to leave. And the doctor says, no, no, I'm not leaving. It just gives way. It, the... Appearance of light puts an end to the condition of darkness. That's the way you want to think about it. The presence of God, when the presence of God comes in, the presence of the light of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit puts an end to the work and the existence of darkness. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so it's the difference between having a picture of home and being at home. The Bible says in Psalm 33 and 1, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise, and here's an old English term, is comely. When's the last time you looked at your wife or your husband and said, You are comely? <laughs> Honey, I don't think we've ever said that. To, we've said a lot of stuff to each other, silly things, powerful things. We ought to pull that one out. That's a, you are so comely. Well, the, the word comely means a number of different things, and it's interpreted a couple of different ways, but one of the most powerful uh, meanings of the word comely is the phrase to be at home with. To be at home with. You go look it up in your Vines Expository Dictionary of New Testament words, you'll see that phrase. Go look it up in Strong's. You get into that list of definitions, to be at home with. So let's, let's insert that in there. Let's read it one more time. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise is to be at home with God for the upright. I didn't get saved to stay away from God. Did you get saved to stay away from Jesus? No. no. I got saved to be with him. And so the Bible says praise 
is to be at home with God. We want God in our home, but he wants us in his home. And praise is how you get into the presence of God. Remember, praise is a destination. Praise is a place. Praise is not something you do. Praise is something you enter into. So when the music starts and the singing begins, you make up your mind. Instead of saying, oh, I love this song. It's a toe tapper. This is one of my favorites. I'm going to love singing this song. And you'll spend all your time just singing the song. Song singing is not praise. Praise is when you wake up your glory. David said, I will wake up my glory and I will praise the Lord. And so praise is when you wake up and you say, okay, the music is just simply the call to us to rally into one accord. It's a tool. Is that all it is? It's a tool that gives us the opportunity to blend together in one accord. And when we blend together in one accord, it's not because we all like the tune, like the beat, like the whatever, like the arrangement. You cannot like it. It doesn't matter. It is the call to get into one accord and make the decision, I am going to praise the Lord. You see, if you're a real Christian and you do and you want to enter into real praise, then you understand it is a sacrifice or an offering of praise. I am offering up my soul to you, Lord, and you turn your attitude to him and you begin to praise him. Amen. Amen. So good. Hallelujah. Um, so Let's remember then that simple definition I shared last week about what is praise. Praise is verbalizing the glories of God's character and his acts. That simply, it is verbal, it is extrovert, it is, always involves the vocal cords at some level. So praise is verbalizing the glories of his character and of his acts. Now in Ephesians it says, chapter 1 and verse 12, so that we who first hoped in Christ have been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. We are destined, our destiny is to live for the praise of his glory. If you wonder, why am I on the earth? Perhaps you have set some goals for yourself. Perhaps you hoped your life would turn out to be something. Some of you may be older like I am. I'm 65 years old, and so at 65, I'm constantly looking over my shoulder at some of the projections I had when I was 16 or 26 or 36, and I'm thinking, well, am I anywhere near where I had wanted to be? And so we, we analyze our life. We think about where we're at, and are we succeeding and hitting the mark? Are we accomplishing what we wanted to? We think of our life. And we tend to uh, assess and evaluate our life in those kinds of terms. And you can either be happy doing that or sad doing that. It's a very precarious business. However, the Apostle Paul took, when he assessed his life, he took it completely out of that area of consideration. He would not allow the devil to have anything to work against him with. And he said, I am appointed to live to praise the Lord. That's exact. And he repeated it three times in Ephesians chapter 1. Three times in the first chapter of Ephesians. He said, we are destined. Our life is for the purpose of praising God. So when I go stand before Jesus, it's really going to come down to, did my life, was my life an expression of praise to God? And knowing that praise is vocal and verbal, did I praise the Lord? I have to say to my own shame, and part of what I dealt with in my own personal time at the community table this morning was the times when I should have praised him instead of cursing the situation. Um, we all have that tendency, but thank God the Lord's full of do-overs, right? So we exist to praise God's glory. We are created to bear and to shine forth the presence of God in the physical world. Now, remember I was talking before about how that when Adam sinned, the world, God's presence withdrew from the physical world. 
The physical world was made our stewardship, rule and reign over it, God said to man. Is that not right? So that order from God still stands that we should be ruling and, and reigning over the stewardship of the earth. The earth is under a cloud of darkness. God wants to get the light of his presence, his manifest presence into the earth. How does he do it? Where does it come from? We think he should just kick a hole in the clouds and just drop down and do it. But if you really study the scriptures, you find out that God enters the world through you and I. You and I, specifically our praise, is the portal that brings the manifest manifestation of God's presence. 1 Peter 2.9, I know you're familiar with it, most of you. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth. That word in the Greek that Paul wrote, show forth, is the word celebrate, or to praise, or to rave. That you should show forth, celebrate the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, I want you to understand, had he left the word praises out and said, you have been ordained as a peculiar people, holy nation, royal priesthood, to show forth, um, uh, to celebrate rather, he who called you out of darkness. It would have left the manner of our celebration up to us. Some people celebrate in front of the TV, quiet with cheese and crackers. Some people celebrate by running around and doing cartwheels and getting loud. People celebrate always based on what's comfortable to their proclivities. But he didn't leave the celebration up to you and I. He said, you have been called to celebrate the praises. Not just celebrate he who called you out of darkness, but to celebrate the praises of him who called you. So now, Nick doesn't get to just make up how he wants to celebrate Jesus who called me out of darkness. There's a prescribed way, and it's called praising God. Praise is what I'm called to use to bring the Lord into this world of darkness out of which he has saved me. Put it to you like this. Praise welcomes and introduces God's presence into our physical domain because praise is what he inhabits. You all have heard the verse in Psalm 2, 22 and verse 3. You are holy, he's speaking to God, enthroned on and live in the praises of Israel or the praises of God's people. Now in Israel, God's glory or his presence was limited to the temple there on top of Mount Zion. So God's glory lived in the temple. Remember they had the dedication prayer. Oh Lord, hear us when we pray in this house and when we're in this temple, may your presence be in this temple. When Jesus Christ came, the, th the reason they had such a terrible time with him is he kept doing things outside of the temple. They had a real problem with it. You know, you got those sick people, drag them to church appropriately on Saturday and turn them over to the Pharisees, the, the priests and so forth, and let them put them through the whatever process they get. And then if God wants to heal them, let them do it. But you, you just... You just jump the track, and uh, completely ignore the temple. In fact, not only do you ignore the temple, they were furious. You said, destroy the temple, and I'll raise it up again in three days. That's how, that's how important your temple is. Just knock the thing down, and I'll rebuild it in three days. That's how insignificant your temple is. And they just, their eyes were spinning in their head when they heard that. And that, they brought that up at the trial. That's eventually a big reason as to why they crucified Jesus. And when you read the transcript in the Gospels of the trial. So, God did something dynamic between the Old and New Testament. He moved the place of the manifest presence of God out of the physical temple and put it into the hearts of those that love Jesus. And he said, your heart, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your heart, 
that loves me, that's where I dwell. Me and my Father live in the heart. And so now we've got these mobile temples. You can't control them. They're running all over the place. They're multiplying. And the Lord can enter this physical world with his manifest presence through any one of the millions of mobile temples that decide to use the value of what they've become and praise the Lord. I'll tell you, if you and I catch this revelation and put more effort into praising than we do and less into trying to make things change and more effort into praising God for the change that he's already said is his will to bring to us, we would see fantastic things in Jesus' name. That's why Paul wrote, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you hope to see the glory of demon-binding deliverance or the glory of peace or the glory of healing, then begin yourself to praise and project his presence into your situation. You know, <clears throat> I'm going to close with this thought. When... Um, when troubles arise, all hell breaks loose, and um, uh, whatever it is, sickness, economic strife, problems. When troubles break out, people always say, you know, <clears throat> someone ought to do something. Someone ought to do something in this family. Someone ought to do something in this business. Someone ought to do something in this church. When that happens, guess who ought to do something? Guess what that something is that ought to be done? When trouble arises, that's when God's royal priesthood and peculiar people need to start showing forth the praises of him who called them out of darkness. We were called out of darkness and then put right back into it once we became the children of light. In the twinkling of an eye, we were saved, bang, our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ. We are children of the light, but we're still living out here in the darkness. We're God's flashlight. And the only way you can be turned on and show any light in the darkness is when you open your mouth. That light comes out of your mouth. It doesn't come out of your mind. It doesn't come out of just the works of your hands. It comes literally out of your mouth. Hallelujah. Show forth the praises of him. Too many Christians want to be a, I like to be a quiet witness. My works speak for me. That is awesome. But you know you can't run a successful marriage on that. Because eventually those pesky spouses want to hear what you think about them. Those little bitty deeds you do. After a while... They get the message that you'd be doing those deeds whether they were there or not because you just like the house to be in order. You just like an ordered life. So it's nice to show your deeds. That's wonderful. But if you want to see the manifest presence of God, begin to learn to praise the Lord. And with that closing thought, I'm going to direct your, your thoughts. And if you're a note taker, you want to put down 2 Chronicles chapter 20. When... Three enemy nations confederated together to destroy Judah. And King Jehoshaphat knew that he was about to be wiped out. They had crossed over into the land of Judah. And everything was about to be over with for the kingdom of Judah. And they cried out upon the Lord and they fasted and sought God. And the prophet of God came and said, The Lord is, is extending a word to you. And he's saying, um, the battle is not your battle. The battle's the Lord's battle. God has a strategy. And so they sought the Lord, and they got together. And you know what? I'll just read it to you. It says, after consulting with the people, the king appointed singers, not special ops. He's, he's not sending the Navy. He's not sending the Air Force. He, he's not sending the SEALs. He's sending the singers. The king appointed singers to walk ahead 
of the army singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. And this is what they sang. I'm still reading. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. What a, what a strategy to destroy the enemy. That's God's idea of a tank. Can you say praise the Lord? Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. Now it goes on. Here's where I want you to really catch what's being said. At that very moment, they begin to sing and give praise. The Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. Woo-wee! Hallelujah! Did you catch that? At the moment, they started to do what? Sing. sing! At the moment they began to sing, God caused. At the moment they began to sing... God caused. One more time. At the moment they began to sing. God caused. Do you think God has got some causes in your life? I want to challenge you to begin to put praise in front of all your battles this week. And to see what God will cause on your behalf. Do you believe your Father loves you? Do you believe that he has some things he'd like to cause to happen? I challenge you, put the singers out in front of everything. Get your praise out there and just begin to praise the Lord. This could be a challenge for me just like it is for you. And begin to thank and praise God and let's see what God will cause to do. Does that sound good? Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, close your Bible, stand with me.